Montanero Davis, a civic plaster alum, Professor Emeritus, and award-winning dramatic leader, uh, and Zach Downs, uh, also a journalism faculty member and our technical producer. And my big thanks to Dr. Karen Decker, uh, chair of the yeah. music department. former dean and president at the college, who used to play the piano at the College of Anderson in the dormitories. He was a close friend of Robert Frost, and he's the reason that Frost made his visit to our campus here. Wow. Uh, thanks to the Piceburg College Foundation for sponsoring the event. Frost Live is a sequel to a recent an evening with Robert Frost. A Zoom event superbly co-hosted by Dr. Anna Battagelli of the English Department. 75 people attended. Uh, they heard Frost, uh, well some of them uh, actually were alums going back to 1951 who had met Frost on campus. They heard Frost on the campus in 1959 uh, discussing and reading his poems. A number of them asked uh, to hear the recording again in person reason for the event uh, today, and they wanted to hear dramatic readings of Frost's poems. That recording uh, will be played today, uh, divided into three segments. Uh, first, uh, Frost will talk about the importance of tone in his writing, uh, then his preference for metaphors uh, in formal verse, and finally his experience as, as a teacher. Nor dramatic readings of home burial, the Road Not Taken, and The Witch of Goas will make his poems come, up, come alive. By the time of this recording, Frost was a national icon as a person and also as, as a writer. He had published more than 20 uh, volumes of poetry by this time. Uh, he had won four Pulitzer Prizes, and uh, just a short time after he left uh, in 1959, Congress uh, honored him with the gold medal. It's the highest uh, award given by the nation to a civilian. And he also read one of his poems at the presidential inauguration of John and F. Kennedy. He was also a frequent visitor to Blacksburg. Uh, nearly every summer from 1945 to 1959, he was a guest at the home of Doc Redkay uh, on Cumberland Head. During nine of those summers, at least nine of those summers, uh, he gave a talk on the campus. He hosted at teas for faculty and staff, and he dropped into classes uh, to speak. All the fun is in how you say a thing, Frost said. Almost all of Frost's poems are experiments in tones of voice and ways of saying the thing. He captured the cadences of New Englanders talking and the intonations of everyday conversation. The sound you hear of people talking in another room when you cannot hear their words. Frost said, when literature comes alive, it speaks. He called his poems talk songs. In his talk poems, Frost creates living sentences by marrying tones of everyday conversation to idiom, syntax, meaning, and the unstressed stress pattern of English speech. Readers recreate those living sentences through their conversational experience. You can't read a single good sentence, Frost said, with the salt in it, unless you've heard it previously spoken. In our first segment, Frost is going to talk about the importance of tone in writing. My greatest, the greatest lack in all this reading that you do, these theme, themes, and is a kind of dismal tone they have uh, of the statement on statement on statement on statement without any of what I'm going to speak of. First is the, first is the words, the vocabulary, and the, then there's the grammar, structure, and then there's the idea, and then after you've said all that, there's still something more that's very hard to describe. I've tried for years to get it. It's a, it's a dramatic tone in the sentences. 
That's the part that goes dead, first of all, in, in perfunctory writing. And you read pages and pages of things without a, a live sentence in it. All correct and all that. And I found, I found that I did better never to correct anything, but to take an interest in the thought and once in a while I'll remark on, you know, a little, little more life than these sentences would do me good. Never mind you. The only three verse poem I ever wrote, I ever said to you, uh, a lady said to me, you've been saying all sorts of things to South California, uh, the president's wife or something. She said to me, you've been saying all sorts of things tonight. Which are you, conservative or radical? <laughs> and I, I said, look her right in the eyes, and I said, I never dared be radical when young, for fear it would make me conservative when old. <laughs> I was hanging up there in California. <laughs> and then you want to hear a dreadful one? Well, they turn on another voice, and I'm tired almost. This is called provide, provide, see? We don't have to say that to you as Americans anymore because it's all taken care of you. Government provides for you. But they, this is an old-fashioned form again, see? Uh, they, uh, I, I, I told a young cousin of, of uh, mine, cousin of my grandson's, that my grandson had just got a, gone to work for the government in Washington, and I told him about why he can retire, he said, at 49. That's what they thought about, you know, retire. The last thing I think about, I'm going to retire. Going to let my autobiography when I retire. <laughs> On some day. Provide, provide. And I might tell you, there's been a strike of when I, that this is a memory of a strike at Harvard College of the, of the scrub, for the scrub women. The boys struck, the whole college struck, and they got a raise in their wages. And the leader of that strike is a rather well-known, what shall I call him, I don't want to get arrested, uh, but he's a rather well-known uh, communist. Whenever I, uh, the last time I met him, I said to him, congratulations, he's a big strong fellow. And I said, congratulations, he said, for what? I said, for being out of jail. <laughs> But he led that strike, a successful strike, and he went on to try to lead the world, I think, down the same road, world strike or something like that. But now I leave that, these women I was thinking of. The witch that came, the withered hag, to wash the steps with pail and rag, was once the beauty of the shag, the picture pride of Hollywood. Too many fall from great and good for you to doubt the likelihood. Die early and avoid the fate. Or if predestined to die late, make up your mind to die in state. Make the whole stock exchange your own. If need be, occupy a throne. Monaco, you know. <laughs> Some of where nobody can call you chrome. Some have relied on what they knew. Others on being simply true. What worked for them might work for you. No memory of having starved makes up for later disregard or keeps the end from being hard. Better to go down dignified with one friendship at your side than none at all. Provide, provide. <laughs> Now look at the, look how I enjoy that. 
well made in those comments, you know. Yeah, well, uh, I, I, did, I like that so much the first time I said it was in Washington, but from the man in front of me. And uh, he became a friend of mine, quite a friend of He was still down there, still with that. Uh, uh, when I got through, I said, Better go down, dignified, with what and friendship at your side, than not at all, but provide, provide. And then I said, uh, Somebody else, I'll provide for you. <laughs> He's going on with the tone, making it worse and worse. And how do you like that? <laughs> Frost created memorable voices, personas, the practical farmer of mending wall, who sees the absurdity of repairing the wall, but does it anyway. The traveler, stopping by woods on a snowy evening, uh, tempted by dark woods, but obliged by beauty. And the husband and wife of home burial, traumatized by the death of their firstborn, their relationship shattered, and their dialogue disconnected monologues, nor will perform uh, from home area. speaking showcase, I first performed this poem more than 40 years ago. Wow, <laughs> I can't believe I said that. I was talking to Bob the other day and he was talking about things being 70 years ago. So I guess it's not so bad. But 70 years ago was great, right Rob? <laughs> Doc Red King came to me after the event and said that this was the only poem that Robert Frost never read publicly. I remember thinking, Frost doesn't like doing female voices. Now, I know. Frost, like the husband in this poem, lost his firstborn son, Elliot, at the age of four, from cholera. Asked, what are his greatest words of wisdom Frost once replied, in three words, I can sum up everything I've learned about life. It goes on. At first I thought these words were so trite, but now after more than 40 years of living, I recognize that they are the greatest advice we can give anyone. In preparing for this event, I had the privilege of talking with many alums and community members. One alum from the 60s shared Frost's words that life goes on and that her daughter drowned at 19. She said a father who had lost his 19-year-old son to suicide asked her one day, does it ever get any better? She said, no, it doesn't get better. But life goes on, you get better. In this poem, the mother whose footsteps are stuck in yesterday is unable to go on and resents her husband's ability to do so. Home burial by Robert Frost. He saw her from the bottom of the stairs before she saw him. She was starting down, looking back over her shoulder at some fear. He spoke, advancing toward her. What is it you see from up there always? For I want to know. Her face changed from terrified to dull. She, in her place, refused him any help with the least stiffening of her neck and silent. She let him look. 
sure that he wouldn't sing. Blind creature. And a while, he didn't sing. But at last he murmured, Oh, he said. Oh. What is it? What? She said. Just that I see. You don't, she challenged. Tell me what it is. The wonder is I didn't see it once. I never noticed it from here before. The little graveyard where my people are. There are three stones of slate and one of marble. But I understand it's not the stones, but the child's mound. Don't! 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 She cried. She withdrew, shrinking from beneath the arm that rested on the banister and slid downstairs, and turned on him with such a daunting look. He said twice over before he knew himself, Can a man speak of his own child he's lost? Not you. I don't know rightly whether any man can. Amy, don't go to someone else this time. There's something I should like to ask you, dear. You don't know how to ask it. Help me, then. Her fingers move the latch for all reply. My words are nearly always an offense. I don't know how to speak of anything so as to please you. But I might be taught, I should suppose. I can't see how. She moved the latch a little. Don't! Don't go. Don't carry it to someone else this time. Let me into your grief. I'm not so much under, unlike other folks as your standing there apart would make me out. Give me my chance. I do think, though you overdo it a little, what was it that brought you up to think it the thing to take the mother loss of your first child so inconsolably in the face of love? You'd think his memory might be satisfied. There you go. Sneering now. I'm not. I'm not. You make me angry. And it's come to this. A man can't speak of his own child that's dead. You can't because you don't know how to speak. If you had any feelings, you that dug with your own hand, how could you? His little grave. I saw you from that very window there, making the gravel leap, leap in the air, leap up like that, land so lightly and roll back down the mound beside the hole. I thought, who is that man? I didn't know you. And I crept down the stairs and up the stairs to look again. And still, your spade kept lifting. Then you came in. I heard your rumbling voice out in the kitchen. And I don't know why, but I went near to see with my own eyes. You could sit there with the stains on your shoes from your own baby's grave and talk about your everyday concerns. You stood the spade up against the wall outside there in the entry, for I saw it. I shall laugh the worst laugh I've ever laughed. God, if I don't believe I'm cursed. I can repeat the very words you were saying. Three foggy mornings in one rainy day will rock the best birch fence a man can build. Think of it. Talk like that in such a time. What and how long it takes a birch to rot to do with what was in the drunken parlor? You couldn't care. 
The nearest friends go with anyone to death, come so far short they might as well not go at all. No. From the time when one is sick to death, one is alone. And he dies more alone. Friends make pretense of following to the grave. But before one is in it, their minds are turned in making their way back to life and living people and things they understand. But the world's evil. I won't have grief so if I can change it. Oh, I won't. I won't. There. You've said it all and you feel better. You won't go now. You're crying. Close the door. The heart's gone out of it. Why keep it up? Amy, there's someone coming down the road. You! Yeah. Oh, you think the talk is all? I must go. Somewhere out of this house. How can I make you? If you do. Where do you mean to go? First tell me that. I'll follow you and bring you back by force. I will. outlived four of his six children. His mother uh, and his sister uh, were institutionalized for depression, and his relationship with his wife uh, fractured. As Eleanor lay dying in 1938, he walked down the stairs and up the stairs outside the room she was in, hoping to be admitted. She never called again. Two years later, his oldest son, uh, suffering from depression, committed suicide with a shotgun. But except for a home burial, Frost never writes directly about his grief. He writes indirectly through metaphors, saying one thing in terms of another. Metaphors, he believed, were the heart of all creative thought and all poetry. A poem begins in delight, Frost said, and it ends in wisdom. It begins with a lump in the throat, a sense of wrong, a homesickness, a lovesickness, and it ends at a clarification of life, a momentary state against confusion. These clarifications of life were Frost metaphors. The road not taken, the woods that are lovely, dark, and deep, and promises we have to keep. The universe that may end in fire or in ice. People along a beach who look one way but cannot look out far or deep. A white moth trapped by a white spider on a white flower. In addition to metaphors, uh, Frost preferred formal stanzas. When other 20th century poets were turning toward free verse, he wrote with meter and rhyme and in stanza form. In our next segment, Frost will talk about his preference for metaphors and formal verse. The thought in all of poems, the base of thought, is metaphor, bringing two things together to your pleasure, surprise, and, and to your enlightenment. Meaning that, like that, I say, I decide to soon play tennis. I, I, I to soon write free verses, play tennis with that. Uh, see, I brought free verse and tennis together. And nearly all our thinking is like that. I say uh, the, uh, the, some of the new politics, uh, the Karl Marx's politics that you've heard of, maybe, uh, is an attempt to so homogenize society that the cream would never rise again. <laughs> That 
arrange that metaphor, you see it's just a metaphor, two things brought together. Now that is, that is the heart of all thinking. I leave that, I can go into that more I have in time. Uh, that the heart of all thinking is metaphor. Two things brought together that click and have, have significance. And you, do, you say an orange is like an apple, that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, but you get you get something with wit in it. I don't know what it is, but it, it has it's it's generated. You go on thinking from it, and all all the thinking of the world is like that. It just take a great philosopher like uh, like Plato, for instance, and Plato just used one metaphor that the whole universe is may be likened unto what that in man that we call reason. That's the whole of Plato. And the, take another philosopher, his, his name was Schopenhauer, and he said that the whole universe may be likened unto that in man which is called will. And that's all. You, you can go through the philosophers that way and you'll find that they, they cling to one great metaphor. And many minor metaphors within the, within the writing and thinking. I don't know about my politics. Uh, indirectly, you have to go in the first way I'm going to vote this time. <laughs> um, we should wish you no gumption. This is the tone I say that in. See, this is the way we talk to each other, you know. You wish you no gumption, you know. See, that must get into the poetry. So, uh, anyway. Uh, this is called the, uh, the objection to being stepped on. This is an off hand one. Uh, 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 this is for people that know the difference between a rake and a hole. Uh, I never know. Uh, you don't know what you got to go on, where people have been, what their education is, what they read, whether they read any Sanskrit or not. I don't bring in, I don't trade on them. My scan Sanskrit talk. I know a friend of mine does. I, I know. And the, the other, you know. And, and I'm not interested in the common man, particularly, but still, you know, you've got to consider that people, most people have that Sanskrit. <laughs> this is the objection being stepped on. At the end of the row, I stepped on the toe of an unemployed hole. It rose in offense and struck me a blow in the seat of my sense. <laughs> it wasn't to blame, but I called it a name, and I must say it dealt me a blow that I felt like malice pretense. You may call me a fool, but was there a rule the weapon should be turned into a tool? Yeah. And what do we see? The first tool I step on turned into a weapon. <laughs> Ring around the rosy almost. 
We dance round in a ring and suppose, but the secret sits in the middle and knows. <laughs> then, and uh, then another one, forgive, O oh Lord, my little jokes on thee, and I'll forgive thy great big one on me. <laughs> Well, then there's this one. It's about a man, and I've said it every time I've been here. Uh, uh, called departmental. Uh, a man on the tablecloth ran into a dormant moth uh, of many times his size. You see, this is a fine one to do the meter of and the rhyming of. The rhymes are close together, the lines are short, and they beat right off like this. A man on the tablecloth ran into a dawn moth. You see, a cloth moth, and, you, and that began a poem. And then it keeps up that way, and you kind of, you've got to watch it and see if the rhymes decide me what to say next or whether I said it, said what I intended. Watch it. And a man on the tablecloth ran into a dawn moth of many times his size. I'll emphasize the rhymes. He showed not the least surprise. His business wasn't with such. He gave it scarcely a touch and was off on his duty run. But if he encountered one of the Hive's inquiry squad, whose work is to find out God and the nature of time and space, he would put him on to the case, answer a curious race, one crossing with hurried tread, the body of one of their dead, isn't given a moment's arrest, seems not even impressed. But he no doubt reports to any with whom he crosses antennae, and those they no doubt report to the higher up in court. Then word goes forth informing. That's that acid language. <laughs> the critics use. Then word goes forth informing. Deaths come to Jerry McCormick, our selfless forager Jerry. Will the special Janissary, whose office it is to bury the dead of the commissary, go bring him home to his people, lay him in state on a sea floor, wrap him for shroud in a petal, and bomb him with ichor of nettle? This is the word of your queen, and presently on the scene appears a solemn mortician, and taking formal position with feelers calmly a twiddle, seizes the dead by the middle, and heaving him high in air, carries him out of there. No one stands round to stare, as nobody else's affair. It couldn't be called ungentle, but a thoroughly departmental. <laughs> Unique to Frost is his ability to capture conversational tones with their formal constraints, as in the next poem of an oral read, The Road to the When I think of this poem, I'm reminded about a lesson I learned the hard way. Read campus bulletin. My late husband and I coached the public speaking and debate team for several decades. And this required us to take a van or two van fulls of students to different tournaments in the United States on the weekends for about 15 weekends for each academic year. When we were not traveling with the team, our Fridays were always something we celebrated. One week in 1984, Al told me to wear something nice on Friday and to meet him outside the Hartman Theater. I was excited about our special date. Now I should tell you that Al loved to put this head redhead in awkward situations and was always entertained by my management of them or lack thereof. Well, I get to Hartman Theater and Al signals for me to come up the stairs. I do. And then he signals for me to come backstage. And I do. It was a little dark back there. And he hands me this binder. And he asks me, can I read the words? And I said, yes. And he pushes me through the curtain. Now, you have to visualize this on a I Love Lucy moment. I had big hair, wore heels, 
and was about 87 pounds. I suffered from anorexia back then. Obviously, I'm cured. <laughs> and I no longer wear high heels. The theater is packed. The president, the vice president, the mayor, all sitting there in the front row. I go click, 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 click to the front of the stage, open my binder, and dramatically read, The Road Not Taken. I finish, and I turn, and a full choir starts singing, Two roads diverge in a hill. We were the readers for Randall Thompson's Frosty Eye. I was nearly knocked off my heels. I quickly ran to the curtain, trying to find my way in so I can kill my husband. <laughs> That's when I learned that I need to read flyers on campus. <laughs> but seriously, if I never wanted to feed the hungry and sang with this singer to raise money for why it was World Hunger Year, I never would have come to Plattsburgh. This singer thought that I would love Plattsburgh. And he was right. If I never came here all those years ago, I never would have had my amazing sons, my amazing husbands, a job that I loved for nearly 40 years, such loving and kind students, friends, and colleagues. I'm so thankful I took the Plattsburgh. The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in the yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere here ages, ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled, and that has made all the difference. By the time he spoke on campus in 1959, uh, Frost had received uh, 23 honorary doctorates. But he was not a fan of formal education. It was a burr that stuck to his coat, he said. He never earned a higher education degree, uh, failing to finish his first semester at Dartmouth. Leaving, he said, so he could be educated. And he lasted only two years at Harvard. Yet he was a teacher for more than 50 years, uh, first at uh, two schools in New Hampshire, before leaving uh, for England in 1912 to gamble on becoming a, a poet. But from 1916 to 1963, when he died, um, he taught for more than 50 years at University of Michigan, uh, Dartmouth, Amherst, Harvard, the Bradley School of uh, Writing, uh, and Plattsburgh State. In his 1959 talk at uh, Plattsburgh, he was talking mainly to teachers. Many of his comments relate to teaching. You probably know enough of me the way you stand up for me. You must know enough about me to know that I'm a teacher. <laughs> My Fellow writers sometimes worry about 
make it in my for the reason that I am a teacher. They were afraid teaching would hurt my poetry. You may not have heard that, but it gets written about. And, and what do they, what's the worry chiefly, I wonder? I think it's theme papers. <laughs> but they don't know how wily I am, how I read theme papers. I'm a very rapid reader. I'm the rapidest reader alive. I, I set a book on the shelf and look at its spine for a long time before I look inside of it to see if I've guessed right about what's in it. <laughs> it doesn't take many pages to settle that with most books. Something else you might be interested in is teaching. You, you wonder how much you ought to excite people to writing poetry, whether you ought to stop children writing poetry, and how soon, how soon can you stop them writing poetry, and why should you stop them writing poetry? Well, maybe you start them writing poetry so as to get over it young. <laughs> get sick of it before they get get to coming to coming around where I am. Uh, the last three days I've had uh, been spoken to in public places by pleasant ladies, husband with them, uh, and all, everything all right. And they, they, they but uh, and what it led up to was they wanted to send me some poems. And, what, and furthermore, they hoped I'd deliver an opinion on them. And I said, no, you can send them to me, but I do nothing about it. I'll read them. And if they really knock me over backward, you'll probably hear from me. The, the writing of children is your problem, my problem, young people all the time. Uh, I've come to a point with some grown-up boys in college, reading their poems off and on, where I was afraid that just holding my, their poems in my hand might commit them to a career of trying to, uh, a vain career of trying to be poets. And I remember saying to one boy, uh, I, he handed me a bundle, another bundle of poems, you know, and I held them a minute and I said, Green, do you mean it? He said, no, no, I'm going to be a lawyer. I said, then I can read the blasted stuff. You know, I was thinking how many educational things have crept into my poems, from, some from being a farmer, some from just being a human being, and some from being a teacher, all sorts of things like that. I, for instance, I'm going to say to you uh, the Mende Wall poem. And in that, there's a line that I never would have put in if I had never been a teacher. I hadn't been a, a troubled teacher. It's a, a troubled one. Uh, uh, and uh, you, I'll speak, I won't speak, but see if you catch it. No, you won't catch it until I point out. But I'll point out. <laughs> this, uh, let's see, I don't mean, I know it by heart. Uh, 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 and this was a regular farm job. Every every year, in the spring of the year, a little earlier than this, the first thing we did uh, was get together with our neighbor and restore the stone wall between our farms for no earthly use except it was a custom. And we ceased to try to keep cows in that way. Everybody here was beginning to use barbed wire anyway, but we set the wall up again every year. Fell down every winter. We set up every spring. And it was a regular thing. And I, I say I let my neighbor know beyond the hill. As a matter of fact, I, he let me know usually. And he was more punctilious about it than I was. And here we were at it. Uh, something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen ground swell under it, and spills the upper boulders in the sun, and makes gaps even two can pass abreast. The work of hunters is another thing. I have come after them and made repair where they have left not one 
storm on the storm, but they would have the rabbit out of hiding to please the yelping dogs. The gaps I made, no one has seen them made or heard them made, but at springtime, mending time, we find them there. I let my neighbor know beyond the hill, and on a day we meet to walk the line and set the wall between us once again. We keep the wall between us as we work to reach the boulders that have fallen to each. And some are loaves, and some are nearly balls. We have to use a spell to make them balance. Stay where you are until our backs are turned. That's about as long as they say, till our backs are turned. Oh, just another kind of off ball game, one on the side. It comes to a little more. There where it is, we do not need the wall. He is all fine, and I am apple orchard. My apple trees will never get across and eat the cones under his vines, I tell him. He only says, good fences make good neighbors. Spring is the mischief in me, and I wondered if I could put a notion in his head. Why do they make good neighbors? Isn't it where there are cows? But here there are no cows. Before I built a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling on, and to whom I was like to give offense. Something the resident love wall that wants it done. I could say else then, but it's no else exactly, and I'd rather he'd, he'd say it for himself. I see him there bringing a stone grasped firmly by the top in each hand, like an old stone savage arm. He moves in darkness, as it seems to me, in other woods only, in the shade of trees. He will not go behind his father's saying, and he likes having thought of it so well, he says again, good fences make good neighbors. See, and you, you can see that's a very figurative thing. You can take it a lot of ways. But the, the, the line that I got out of being a teacher is, you know, I'd rather he said it for himself. <laughs> All the years I've ate, that some of the students would say something for themselves that I didn't put into their heads. <laughs> I used to think I'm going to a class today. You see, I say to somebody, I'm going to class today, I'm going to just get there and sit to see if somebody won't say something. Say, and sit. And, and every time I got embarrassed and I was the first speaker, <laughs> they didn't seem to embarrass at all. There I waited for somebody to say something great and original, and nobody said the name word. It's my love. But you're just in San Bernardino, my man, you know, Every day, as I walked toward, I walked toward the class, went up the hill in the class, every day a kind of an animus got up in me, you know, to do something to him. Not to just say something to him, but to do something to him. And, oh, and when the animus was strong enough, I hoped it had a pretty good time. <laughs> I talked about it with inspiration, but with animus. Animus. And uh, the, these, some of these go way, way back before my teaching, but that line right on my teaching, and there are other lines just the same. That I, I think that's the heart of it all. If I could only get somebody to say something in one of my classes, the, the, Surprise me, you know. Just doesn't it need to be a big, great thing like the uh, like the theory of evolution, for instance. You know that Darwin only I want you know that occurred to him when he was seasick. It ran with terror and with cunning crept. It faltered, 
I could see it hesitate. Then in the middle of the open sheet, cower down in desperation to accept whatever I accorded it of faith. I had none of the tender than thou collectivistic regimenting love with which the modern world is being swept. But this poor microscopic item now, since it was nothing I knew we love, I let it lie there till I hope it slept. I have a mind myself and recognize mine when I meet with it in any guise. No one can know how glad I am to find on any sheep the least display of mind. <laughs> back to it again. You know where I got that? No one can know how glad I am to find on any sheet the least display of mine. Read the theme papers. <laughs> this this ends the uh, cross recording. Uh, Nora will conclude the session by reading uh, The Witch of Coas, uh, a story about uh, a woman's infidelity with a hired man, uh, his murder and burial in the cellar, and supernatural res resurrection, a dark story told by a witch uh, and her simple-minded 50-year-old son. <laughs> 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 what I love about this poem is the feistiness of the old lady. I was always impressed with Frost's ability to get inside the mind of a woman and write in a woman's voice. When you look inside of a woman's brain, you see messages going everywhere. They like just don't click, they go, go, they go this way, that way, this way, that way. Everything is connected to everything else. We just don't quit thinking. Before I went down the aisle, my dad's words of wisdom were, to be honest, and to always tell my husband everything I was thinking. <laughs> I would talk, 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 and then I'd ask him, what are you thinking? And he would say, nothing. I never believed him. In fact, I was often hurt that he was hiding his feelings from me. Well, it took me about six months to learn that when I asked him what he was thinking and he said nothing, that he was actually capable of thinking nothing. <laughs> <laughs> the Witch of Colas by Robert Frost. I stayed the night for shelter at a farm behind the mountains with a mother and son. Two old believers. They did all the talking. Folks think a witch has to lay his spirits. She should call up to pass a winter evening. But it won't. Should be burned at the stake or something. Some of the spirits is it, but, but who's got the but not have that no. Mother can make a common table rear and kick with two legs like an army mule. And when I've done it, what good have I done? Rather than tip a table for you, let me tell you what Rally the Sioux Control once told me. He said the dead had souls. But when I asked him how that could be, I thought the dead whistles. He broke my train. Don't that make you suspicious that there's something the dead are keeping back? Yeah, there's something the dead are keeping back. You wouldn't want to tell them what we have up the attic, Mother. Boom! A skeleton. But the headboard of Mother's bed is pushed against the attic door. The door is nailed, it's harmless. Mother hears it in the night, halt and perplexed behind the barrier of door and headboard. Where it wants to get is back into the cellar where it came from. We'll never let him, will we, son? We'll never. It left the cellar 40 years ago and carried itself like a pile of dishes 
up one flight from the cellar to the kitchen, another from the kitchen to the bedroom, and another from the bedroom to the attic. Right past both father and mother, and neither stopped it. Father had gone upstairs, mother was downstairs. I was a baby. I don't know where I was. The night the bones came up the cellar stairs, Toffel had gone to bed alone and left me, but left an open door so as to cool the room off. I was just coming to myself to wonder where the cold was coming from when I heard Toffel upstairs in the bedroom and thought I heard him downstairs in the cellar. The boy would be laid down to walk dry shot on when there was water in the cellar and spring struck the hard cellar bottom. And then someone began the stairs. Two footsteps for each step, the way a man with one leg and a crutch or a little child comes up. It wasn't awful. It wasn't anyone who could be there. The bulkhead double doors were double locked and swollen tight and buried under snow. The cellar windows were banked up with sawdust and swollen tight and buried under the snow. <clears throat> it was the bones. I knew them. Good reason. My first impulse was to get to the knob and hold the door. But the bones didn't try the door. They hawk and helpless on the land and wait for things to happen in their favor. The famous restless rustling ran all through them. Never could have done the thing I did if the wish hadn't been too strong in me to see how they were mounted for this walk. I had a vision of them, put together, not like a man, but like a chandelier. So suddenly I flung the door wide on him. A moment he stood balancing with emotion and all but lost himself. A tongue of fire flashed out and licked along his upper teeth. Smoke rolled inside the sockets of his eyes. And then he came to me with one hand outstretched, the way he did in the live ones. But this time I struck the hand off, brittle on the floor. The finger pieces slid in all directions. I see one of those pieces lately. Hand me my button box. It must be there. I sat up on the floor and shouted, Toffel, it's coming up to you. It had its choice of the door to the cellar or the hall. It took the hall door for the novelty and set off briskly for so slow a thing. Still going every which way in the joints, though, so that it looked like lightning or a scribble from the slap I had just now given its hand. I listened till it almost climbed the stairs from the hall to the only finished bedroom before I got up to do anything. Then ran and shouted, shut the bedroom door, Tom, for my sake. Company, he said, don't make me get up. I'm too warm in bed. So lying forward, weeping on the handrail, I pushed myself upstairs. And in the light, the kitchen had been dark. I had to own I could see nothing. Tough. I don't see him. It's with us in the room now. It's the bones. What bones? The cellar bones out of the grave. That made him throw his bare legs out of bed and sit up by me and take hold of me. I wanted to put out the light and see if I could see it, or else move the room with their arms at the level of our knees and bring the chalk pile down. I'll tell you what. It's looking for another door to try to get outdoors. Let's trap him with the open door up at it. Toffel agreed to that. And sure enough, almost the moment given an opening, the steps began to climb the attic stairs. I heard them. Thought didn't seem to hear them. Quick! I slammed the door and held the knob. 
Tom, get nails. I made him nail the door shut and push the headboard of the bed against it. Then we asked, was there anything up attic that we'd ever want again? <laughs> the attic was less to us than the cell. If the bones like the attic, let them have it. Let them stay in the attic. When they sometimes come down the stairs at night and stand perplexed behind the door and headboard of the bed, brushing their chalky skull with chalky fingers with the dry sounds of the rattling of the shutter, that's what I sit up in the dark to say to no one anymore since Tom applied. Let them stay in the attic since they went there. I promised Tom to be cruel to them, to help them and be cruel once to him. We think they had a grave down in the cellar. We know they had a grave down in the cellar. We never could find out whose bones they were. Yes, we could too, son. Tell the truth for us. They were a man his father killed for me. I mean, a man he killed instead of me. Least I could do was help take their grave. We were about one night. Son knows the story, which was not for him to tell the truth. Son looked surprised to see me and the lie we've kept up all these years, so as to have it ready for outsiders. But tonight, I don't remember why I ever cared. Tom, if he were here, I don't think he could ever tell you why he ever cared himself. Does anyone have remembrances of Robert Frost? Uh, Met him when he was on our capital. Mm -hmm. uh, but before we, before we open the floor, oh, sure. the yep. Well, this is a memory of Robert Frost, but I served here uh, 17 years as the Dean of Arts and Sciences, and I got to work with Ron the whole time I was here. And, um, I don't know if you know, but Ron's retiring this year after 51 years. Oh. Yay. I have to give Ron a particular compliment in that I enjoyed working with him all the time because I found him to be a man with a lot of common sense. And one thing I have learned over the years, the common sense is not common. <laughs> He loved his field of journalism, he loved teaching, he was always sincerely concerned with the students, and that made him a really great colleague and, and faculty member. And um, I just want to share that life does go on. <laughs> there is life after retirement, and I know you're going to love it. So okay, thank, thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Would you like to introduce your event this time? Yeah. Sure. Christine, do you want to say anything? No. Okay. It's all you. <laughs> um, Nora contacted me um, uh, a couple weeks ago, and um, I'm really glad she did um, because this goes hand in hand perfectly. Um, on Sunday, uh, Champlain Valley Voices, which is a uh, local choir under the direction of Timothy Morningstar, who is a professor here. He's one of the most nice and personal people ever, if you haven't met him. Um, we're going to be doing our spring concert, and uh, part of that will be a rendition of Frostiana. 
which is uh, Randall Thompson's uh, composition, which sets uh, several Robert Frost poems to, uh, to music. And um, it's just a perfect marriage of uh, text and music. Um, so we'll, of course, be singing The Road Not Taken. Um, also stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening, which is very famous and just lends itself to music with the meter. Um, I'm really humbled to be here. Um, there's a lot of just uh, talent and passion in this room right now of things that are before my time, and I, I'm <laughs> awestruck. Um, and we're just super excited to share what we've been preparing. Um, Champlain Valley Voices uh, is, like I said, a community group, so we really hope you can come out and support us and um, uh, get us also ready for our fall concert, which is going to be uh, Sunday, really Mother's Day. Yeah, Sunday is Mother's Day also, so it's a great opportunity to spend some time with someone you love. Um, it's at Hawkins Hall at 3 p.m. Uh, in the Guilds Auditorium. And um, like I said, we hope to see you there. Um, if you are on Facebook, we have a Facebook event, uh, Champlain Valley Voices. You can look for our, uh, our group there. And I'd be happy to take any questions um, afterwards. And you'll notice on the back of your program, it is mentioned here. Um, so like I said, I'm just really happy Nora reached out to us. And we're really happy to share what we prepared. And we'll also be doing um, some pieces that are arranged by Aaron Copeland, um, his old American songs, some selections from that, which include uh, these from Appalachian Spring. So a lot of great 20th century music. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs> Association president is with us today, uh, Talma Azim. Uh, she was one of uh, Ron's uh, teaching assistants last semester, so she'd like to say something. Uh, hi, y'all. Sorry for my shabby parents. I just ran from class because I couldn't miss this event <laughs> for the world. <laughs> Not only because of the man that we've been discussing for a while, Robert Frost has been my favorite poet for a while, but for a man who I've loved since I've been part of SUNY Plattsburgh family, and that's Ronald Davis. Uh, he, I met him, the first time I met him was over Zoom uh, in the blessed year of 2020. No, it's 2020, it's been two years, I can't believe. Um, he was one of the first professors I've met, and being an international student, um, the way Ron and Nora have helped me in my transition, helped me become, pa uh, become part of this society, become part of Plattsburgh, fall in love with this place. They always call themselves my, uh, they call me their adopted daughter, <laughs> they are my American parents. They've been through, they've, they've been through for me for, for it all. And I wish I could say that Ron loves me more than his other students and I'm one of the lucky few but sadly that's not the case. In, in the last 51 years I'm sure there are many Taiwas out there who have even more stories about how Ron has gone out of his way to help them. But now that journey is coming to an end, the 51 years are ending, it's going to be a huge loss. That's, that's something that's not, it doesn't even need to be said but I think someone had to say all these things. Well, thank you very yeah. much. <laughs> <laughs> this is a... What a pleasant, surprise. Um, any, uh, anyone with remembrances or stories they've heard about Robert Frost when he was on campus? Agnes Pearl. In 1956, I came as a freshman to Plattsburgh State in the nursing program. I grew up in Long Island, and upstate to me meant above the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> and one fall night, we, my father and mother drove me to Plattsburgh. I had never seen the campus. And all of a sudden, I was aware of where are the stores? Because all I saw were trees. 
And even though people talked about the Long Island of then of the potato bones other than Queens, uh, then I realized, where are the people? <laughs> and I was scared of what I had gotten myself into, but certainly could not say anything to my mother or father. But I came to Plattsburgh terrified of living here and had never seen winter like it. And we lived in a dorm and we listened to wiring in the morning, which was always a gathering event. And I went down uh, to shower with the rest of the gals on the floor and they were all getting dressed and I said, what are you doing? We got class at eight o'clock, Agnes, get ready. And I said, it's 10 below. <laughs> and they said, yeah. You know, so what? And I said, your nose must fall off when you go out and weather my back. And it took me a while to get over missing Long Island, but very quickly to fall in love with Plattsburgh. And I learned to love Ken Below, and I learned to love Plattsburgh, and all the phenomenal teachers that we had here. As a nursing major, we spent our first and fourth year on campus, and then we went down to New York City for our clinical training. So I came back in the summer of 59, and I was here when Robert Frost spoke. And, um, we had about close to a hundred nursing majors and we'd been gone from campus for years, uh, a couple of years. But it was Robert Frost at Plattsburgh State. You know, you walked around thinking, what, you know, this must be someone gonna masquerade. Can't have Robert Frost come to Plattsburgh State. We knew nothing about, you know, how that, what the relationship with Dr. Redgate was, and we all knew him. But Hawkins Hall was filled. And I bet you 90% of them were nursing students <laughs> because we couldn't believe what we were, had the privilege of listening to. And seeing his face there and listening to this, it brought back all the wonderful things of that wonderful presentation that Robert Frost was here. Thank you. Try to uh, phrase uh, how many semesters Robert Cross was a visiting professor here. Uh, Dick Teresa, Teresa had told Nora uh, that he had been a visiting professor. Tom Moran said it was more than once, one semester yeah. that he was here. But he had an office uh, next to Nora's uh, earlier husband, Al, uh, in uh, what is now the basement uh, of Hawkins, uh, room 31D. He used to be the writer while that's all open. But he was a, a frequent visitor, and uh, you know, the students that, alums that I've talked to these, with these last, past few weeks shared that, you know, this dropping in classes and how special and cool they felt. You know, they were like, well, Robert Frost just dropped in our English class. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, how cool is that? So, but, but, they, but that they felt so special. I, doing this event and just hearing from alums and people in the community, has been such a blessing to me. I mean, it really has warmed my heart. It's like, you know, folks, we're all connected. We're all related, you know, in some great way. And uh, it's something beautiful. I'm all for the Plattsburgh path. Can <laughs> <laughs> I say something? Uh, I never had a lot of interaction with uh, Ron, but uh, I've been, uh, for a, a matter of time, uh, I served as chair of the college council. And after getting involved in all the interactions of the college, it wasn't long before I found out that we had a very valuable asset at our college. And it was a pleasure to have worked along with him in so many ways. And we wish him the best in retirement. <laughs> Thank you.
Oh, you just enjoy it. <laughs> I uh, never had the pleasure of uh, attending one of one of the sessions here. Uh, I became a student. I became a student here in '61. Uh, but one of the things that I benefited from uh, uh, one of my professors was Dr. Dr. Noyes, yes. and he oh, was uh, a, par a very close friend mm -hmm. of uh, Robert Frost, mm -hmm. and uh, we, I. I uh, had the pleasure of taking a course in American literature from uh, Dr. Noyes, and there was a major component of that course that was uh, devoted to Robert Frost's writings. Mm -hmm. yeah. John, that's beautiful. Thank you, thank you, Brian. Oh, we have some in the back. <laughs> Hi, I'm Susan Neal. My dad was at when I was growing up. And, and during that time, Ed Redkay was like our uncle. My sister, brother, and I we were kids, and he would just drop over for lunch or drop over for dinner or you know, take us someplace. And the first year that we met Robert Frost, he took us and took us all for a dinner out to the Royal Savage Inn. <laughs> and my brother and sister and I each had a menu that the uh, management told us that we could take and we could get Robert to put his autograph on there. Well, he didn't think that was such a great idea to just sign it himself. So he told us that he would be the last one to sign it. And everybody at the table had to sign their autographs <laughs> on it. And then and he made each of us tell him something that we liked about uh, coming to live in Plattsburgh. And every year from then on, we would go and hear him when he spoke uh, at Plattsburgh. And once in a while, we, just, we would see him out at this place. So, it's wonderful. Uh -huh. Wow. Uh -huh. Thank you.